Good morning, Minister. And um, morning. good morning. It's a pleasure to have you. And I must apologize for the, the, the technical delay at the beginning, but uh, it's a very great pleasure to have you this morning. And indeed, I'm pleased to welcome everybody to this event, which is part uh, of the 2024 Future Proofing Europe series, which is sponsored by the Department of Foreign Affairs. And as I mentioned, we're delighted to be joined by your minister, Anders Adler-Kreutz, uh, who will speak to us for about 20 minutes uh, or so on Finland's priorities for the EU for the next five years. And that's against the background of the forthcoming enlargement of the EU, the European elections on the 6th to the 9th of June, and of course on the ongoing war in Ukraine. And then we will go to the question and answers. Uh, just a few administrative details. Um, as this is an online event, uh, you will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, which should be on your screen. Uh, and uh, we would appreciate if the questioners could give us their name and affiliation. And a reminder that today's presentation uh, and Q&A are both on the record. And uh, please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And we're also live streaming uh, this morning's discussion. So very warm welcome to all of you joining uh, via YouTube. Uh, may I present uh, Minister uh, Anders Adler-Kreutz, who has been Minister for European Affairs and Ownership Steering of Finland since June 2023. And he represents Finland in the EU General Affairs Council and is responsible for the country's ownership steering policy for state-owned companies. And he was first elected to parliament in 2015, and he represents the Swedish party uh, in Finland in the parliament. He served as chair of the Swedish parliamentary group from 2019 uh, until 2023. And Minister Adolf Preuss is an architect by profession and is a partner in the architectural uh, company in Finland. And uh, we're aware, Minister, um, that yeah, of your view that the long-term success of Europe is being decided now uh, and that Europe must act now. And of course, it's a pivotal time for Europe. Uh, the European parliamentary elections are fast approaching against the background of a very challenging world. And um, I know, I hope we look forward to you outlining Finland's view on the future of the EU uh, in the next five term your term of the European Parliament and the key priorities that Finland has identified for the EU. Uh, so, Minister, the floor is yours and thank you again for joining us. Thank you and um, happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today and, and of course, my apologies for not being there in, in person. Dublin and Ireland are dear to my heart. That's a fact that not even your very scary Eurovision song could change. But having said that, I realize some might have found the Finnish song scary too, albeit for completely different reasons. Um, but enough of that, on, on to the issues at hand, um, the challenges that the EU is facing and how Finland uh, would like to approach them. Uh, we are living in pivotal times. In less than four weeks, we have elections to the European Parliament. Elections are always crucial, but this time there seems to be more at stake than in a long time. The voters know best, of course, one might say that it's not the job of uh, politicians to tell the voters what to think, but I think it is our obligation to let voters know how we see the world and what we have learned. In many ways, it's all of our job to make sure we say uh, what we see and help voters have a truthful and correct view of, of things uh, as they head to the polls. In uh, today's world, even this has become more challenging. Messages reach us from all kinds of platforms and it's understandable that things can seem overwhelming at times. There are also things going on in Europe and around the world that we have uh, very little direct control over, but that has the power to impact us greatly. Uh, I mean, whether they're here in the US, in Asia, or, or, or anywhere else, we live in a global world. As we speak, we also have a hot war in the middle of Europe. Uh, so in that sense, when you look five years back and think about what the issues at hand were five years ago, uh, we live in quite 
different times. If somebody had told us that we were seriously discussing uh, European ammunition production capacity as a European election issue, uh, then, then uh, five years ago, nobody would really have believed that. Um, so the immediate and present security threat in Europe is Russia's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine. It already led to dramatic changes in the security sphere. Apart from NATO gaining Finland and Sweden as members, it has also led to a new focus on the European defense industry. And here, of course, the reason is clear. We have to make sure Russia's aggression isn't rewarded with anything that could even look like a win. And in order to make sure we are making that happen, we need to step up the game. Uh, I mean, this is not a local conflict in the sense that it's an issue that we have to take care of here, but here, but we also, I mean, the world order as we see it, the world order as it has been existing since the Second World War is, is very much at stake and it's being challenged. And uh, autocrats outside of Russia also look at the reaction of EU and the West uh, in Ukraine. Uh, Finland never shut down our production of uh, grenades and ammunition after the Cold War. Uh, many countries did and are regretting it now. Russia won't stop in Ukraine, and that's why we have to stop Russia there and make sure they leave and pay for the mess created. The issue of security is now on the EU agenda like never before. Uh, the war may seem far away on European island, but it's very close to us here. And in order for all our countries to remain safe, we need to step up now. The countries between the EU and Russia, they are under constant threat. The issue of enlargement today is therefore very much an issue of security. Even though the EU does not have military capabilities itself, uh, that is the responsibility of, uh, of the individual countries. And most have chosen to organize their defense through NATO. The EU still provides a certain level of safety and security. I mean, being a member of the union, it gives you a standing. Uh, it, creates, it creates stability and security. The enlargement is obviously a huge issue and a process that won't be easy. We have set clear merit-based criteria for the countries wanting to join, and these need to be monitored and watched closely. The issue of the rule of law remains central here. In some ways, there is a little bit of irony there, as some countries within the union have shown challenging behavior in this department too. And we can't very well demand more of countries wanting to join than we demand of ourselves. So the rule of law needs to be the bedrock of the European Union now and as we move forward. Apart from the issue of enlargement and security, there are other issues on the agenda as well. As we prepare for the life after the European elections, Finland has defined its goals for the upcoming commission. So our key priorities can be summarized as uh, one, uh, strategic competitiveness, how Europe fares in the competition between uh, the other global powers. Uh, two is compre comprehensive security. Uh, here, I mean, Ukraine is the most pressing issue, but also industrial capacities and, and to some extent, for example, immigration issues. And three, promoting a clean transition. Uh, if there's one industry that is very crucial with regards to our future, it is, uh, I mean, everything that deals with uh, trying to create the premises for, for a clean, uh, clean, sustainable future. The European Union has a tremendous ability to change the world in a good way. We often speak of the so-called Brussels effect. That's what happens when, when we in Europe, the world's greatest single market, decide to move in a certain direction. When we do it right, we can change the way the whole world acts. We are facing what some call a productivity crisis in Europe. The need for both public and private investments here is clear, and we need to make sure we create the best possible circumstances for this to happen. A few, um, a few uh, numbers were released that showed uh, productivity in the US was up 2.6% in the fourth quarter of last year. 
So compared to that, how much do you think that productivity was up in the EU? So it wasn't up at all. It was actually down. It fell by 1.2%. And this is obviously not sustainable. We need action. I mean, this has been the course for, for all too long. And, and if we let that continue, I mean, we will be desperately falling behind. So the long-term competitiveness of Europe needs to be built on the EU's own strengths, on market-based solutions, and on fair competition. This means that we have to move away from subsidies that lure investments to places where they are only viable if supported by constant state aid. We need to get back to normal as we loosen the rules first during COVID and then because of the energy crisis that Russia's brutal attack also led to, we opened up Pandora's box, you could say. And now we sadly seem to be stuck in this situation. Uh, I said that we need to get back to normal, to a situation where we let the market decide where investments should be made, not the size of state subsidies. But with the situation in the US after the Inflation Reduction Act, one might call the current situation the new normal as well. But I'd, I would argue that uh, that would be a grave mistake. We cannot build a sustainable economic model that is reliant and only profitable with the help of uh, governmental interventions. So we need to focus on our strengths and invest in places where there is long-term sustainability to be had. Invest in research and development, invest in uh, clean energy, a good grid, uh, on a uh, research and development infrastructure, uh, all in all. So to create the basis for these investments to be uh, to be to be based on. In Finland, we have built our energy infrastructure, our grid, moved away from fossil fuels in our energy mix, and are moving along to an ever greener energy palette. Uh, any given day, uh, the amount of fossil-based electricity in our system is countable in the single digits. And this has happened uh, through market, through totally market-based solutions without subsidies, by just creating the possibility for the companies to invest. And that's why we have investments in the green transition lined up for over 250 billion euros. All of these will not become reality, of course, but many will. And uh, that is the sustainable way of doing it, of doing this. Get your house in order first and bring in the investments that can benefit from the work that has been done. Uh, so there came our third priority as well, promoting a green transition. Uh, and of course, in order for this to be a possibility, it's uh, essential that the EU sticks to its goals, that uh, we align our 2040 goals with our 2050 commitments. But the elections will be tough. Uh, the outcome may not please all of us, but we should never lose our focus. The EU can be the key to so many good things. We need to make sure that uh, that key opens up the right doors as well. So thank you for your attention. Uh, this is a short overview of how we in Finland uh, view the coming challenges, what our focus is, and I'd be happy to, to hear your questions. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. That's a very good overview of um, a very interesting series of priorities, very forward-looking series of priorities, but, but the challenges as well are also very clear. And um, maybe just to start off uh, with um, uh, one uh, of the main challenges uh, the war in Ukraine. I know mm -hmm. that Finland, as you mentioned, you, you never downsized in the way that other European countries did. And of course, the proximity to Russia uh, has a huge effect, obviously, in, in every way uh, on Finland. But uh, I know you are, have been critical of the response uh, to Ukraine, which is an absolutely uh, pivotal conflict for Europe mm -hmm. uh, to win. How do you yes. feel that Europe... Uh, the EU uh, could, as it were, up its game, improve its uh, its um, contribution to winning the war in Ukraine? Is it more weapons? Is it a different kind of weaponry? Uh, where is the lack and what uh, needs to be done? Yes. Uh, well, it's many things. If I first give a, a little perspective on the, on the Finnish solution, uh, Finland has a population of 5.5 million inhabitants. We have a 
conscript-based military service. It's obligatory for every male. Uh, it's uh, every woman can can enter if if uh, if she wants to, uh, but it's obligatory for every male. Um, we, the the time that you serve is six to twelve months, and then you enter the reserve. Um, our active reserve today is uh, two hundred and seventy thousand. Uh, our mili our wartime reserve uh, can be up to uh, up to nine hundred thousand. So that's a significant force, and that's of course why Finland also, I mean Finland entering NATO is of great benefit to NATO as well. Uh, Finland has invested in. Uh, what some some would call a traditional warfare, the one that we see in, uh, in in Ukraine at present, Finland has the biggest artillery in Europe, 1,400 pieces altogether. So when, uh, for example, Denmark gave away all of its artillery, 19 pieces uh, a few times ago, you can compare that to what Finland believes to be uh, the size that you need for a conflict of today. Uh, we have stockpiles, we have production of our own, and that's why, of course, Finland also has been able to, to give a fairly significant amount to Ukraine. We recently, we recently sent our 23rd aid package. The size of that was 188 million euros. Uh, if you compare that to our size, the size of our economy, that would mean, I mean, only this 23rd would mean France giving 2 billion or German giving three, Germany giving 3 billion Euro, euros of military aid. Uh, Finland's total contribution has been uh, 2 billion euros. If you again compare that to France, it would mean France giving 20 billion euros or Germany giving 30 billion euros. Uh, and uh, I mean, we know that all countries haven't been given equal amounts uh, and, and that, in a sense, is a reflection of maybe us not really understanding what is at stake here. I mean, how, gra how grave this threat is. is all, if all EU members had given, as a share of GDP, an equivalent amount to what the Nordic countries and the Baltic countries have given, Ukraine would have received 70 billion more in military aid. And that would have meant as a real significant difference in, in what's happening now in Kharkiv, for example. Uh, so I think it's uh, it has been concerning uh, to, see, to see, I mean, the differences in the European approach. And I really hope that we will now get, uh, get the help going. And unfortunately, we have lost two years already. Two years ago, I mean, actually five years ago, the government should have handed in the orders should have ramped up their production, uh, should have made it possible for the private companies to make the investments needed so that they can increase the capac capacity. In the front in Ukraine, uh, Ukraine would need something like 8,000 artillery grenades a day. And, and, uh, and that is significantly more than very big European powers uh, produce uh, in a month at, at, at this time. Uh, so we have been totally inadequately prepared for, for this. Well, what shall we do? I mean, we need to commit uh, to, to sustainable aid. We have to have an, a long aid perspective. I think the European def Defence Industrial uh, Program uh, is a good start. But I think we also need to understand that uh, the defence industry can't be a national industrial matter. The single market has to work here too. Um, if you remember the first reaction to the Czech initiative of gathering 800,000 uh, ammunition rounds um, globally, the first European reaction was that can we buy from outside of the EU? Shouldn't we buy from this or that country? And that just shows that we somehow mix national short-term interests with what really is a grave European concern. Now that initiative has moved, moved forward. I'm happy for that, but I think we also when we talk about procurements, military procurements within Europe, when we talk about uh, the defense industry, we have to we have to get the market working so that we don't have a situation where country A only buys stuff from country A, country B from country B, and so on. Because if we do that, we pay too much for we overpay for substandard equipment, and, and we can't afford that. So the single market has to be working. We have long perspective. We have to have to have commitments uh, from all EU member countries because the alternative is just 
not uh, a possible nor a sustainable outcome for the EU. Thank you very much for that comprehensive um, reply. And indeed, I think, as you know, Ireland has been pressing for a number of years for completion of the single market and the single market in industrial armament production now needs to be. Uh, just as a follow up, I have a question, uh, Minister, as a follow up to that. And it's from within the Institute saying that Ireland and Finland have been like minded in their security and defence policy. And since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Finland, of course, has um, joined NATO. Uh, the question really, uh, rather plaintive question, uh, is there a role for neutral countries now in the EU? Uh... Well, I mean, I, I understand the situation in Ireland is totally different compared to Finland, and our, our geographic location is, is different. Uh, in an ideal world, I would hope that there would be a place for, for, for neutral grounds. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, I, I re we really see NATO as the European defense solution. And of course, um, the stronger NATO is, uh, the better I think it is for Europe, that just as a general, as a general um, uh, thought. Um, I think, I mean, in Finland, we had a very stable position until the 20, well, actually until the beginning of 22, uh, only some 20 or 30% of the population favored NATO membership. And then suddenly we, we noticed the increased activities along the border that started along the border to Ukraine, that got people thinking. And after the invasion, I mean, the support immediately went over 50%, and now it's constantly at 80%. And, and people in Finland are really happy about the membership. I mean, we, Finland is, in a way, you could say a very pragmatic country. So when the situation changes, uh, when the premises change, when we get a new understanding of uh, what Russia is capable of, we change our position in this matter that really was a foundation of our foreign policy for, for the post-war, the whole post-war era. But now we are a member and happy with that and, and, and very happy that also Sweden got in uh, uh, a few months ago. I think that's essential also for the stability of, of, uh, of the Baltic area. And I think that both Sweden, Sweden and Finland are, are great assets and, and really do strengthen NATO's capabilities. Yes. Thank you. And indeed, we pay tribute to Finnish help uh, with the commission of our defence forces, where uh, General Esther Pulkanen was a member of that commission and indeed helped oh. significantly in, in uh, drafting proposals for the future development of our defence forces. Um, I have a question uh, from Francis Jacobs um, uh, on uh, the question of enlargement, Minister. And he says the merit-based approach um, uh, regarding enlargement is constantly being challenged, not, recent, not least by recent developments in North Macedonia and above all in Georgia. And how should mm -hmm. the EU react? And why was the US, he asks, quicker to respond than the EU to yesterday's vote in Georgia? Now, I know you responded and indeed um, uh, the um, uh, other uh, neighboring countries responded to Georgia. But France's question is, how should the EU react to the situation uh, that's developing in Georgia, but also in some of the other prospective member states? Yeah. Um, I think... Uh... I think you can say that that for quite a few years, I mean, the EU wasn't really a driving force between uh, behind enlargement, and and uh, and I can understand some frustration among some Western Balkan countries. Uh, but I think now the process is going, and I think it's it's uh, it's paramount that we stick to the merit-based approach. And and uh, as I said in my in my introduction, uh, the rule of law is is paramount. We know. Uh, how detrimental it can be if member states deviate from that path, um, meaning that, of course, we have to get our house, house in order, but we really have to make sure that, that the countries, the, the candidate countries, do the reforms needed so that they have stable, uh, so they are stable rule of law abiding countries when they enter the EU. So we can't, we can't really lower our standards here, I think it's important that we signal uh, to, for example, Georgia in this matter that we view this development as, as serious, that it doesn't uh, help Georgia on its European path, that we expect 
Georgia, as we expect, I mean, our own member countries to, 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 to fulfill, I mean, the demands that we, we, we set on them. Um, then, of course, I mean, this will be a long process. I think there will be steps forward and steps, steps backwards. And we, of course, know that our own structures at present uh, also allows for uh, one member out of 27 to, 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 to really slow the things down. So, of course, there are challenges. Uh, but it's really clear that we are. It, it's really clear that we have to be clear on on, on these demands, and not uh, convey even a, a small hint that that it could be possible to enter without fulfilling, uh, without abiding by our rules. Yes, thank you, Minister. You mentioned the one member, obviously Hungary, and um, Hungary will take over the presidency of the EU on the 1st of July. Um, I think earlier in the year you had met your counterpart in Hungary. Uh, how do you see the uh, situation with regard to Hungarian membership uh, uh, with with the, um, uh, the way they are... Um, facing towards uh, uh, the attitude they're adopting to China, to Russia. Uh, and yet we are uh, having the presidency with Hungary on the 1st of July. What do you feel uh, is the likelihood that this will proceed smoothly? Um, well, of course, we hope that the first intergovernmental conference could be held already in June under the Belgian presidency. And then, of course, we expect uh, we expect Hungary to be an honors broker as a, uh, as a, during its uh, chairmanship. So, 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 so that's, of course, the, the, the starting point. Um, but, uh, I mean, we know the difficulties we had in December when trying to go forward with the enlargement process. Uh, uh, Hungary has said that it has 44 opportunities to, to, to veto any progress. Uh, I think that is... A concern. In general, I think it's uh, concerning that there are these bilateral issues between countries that possibly uh, will be a hindrance towards enlargement, whereas enlargement should be uh, uh, based on, 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 a, on a common common set of targets and, and goals that are set by the EU and not, may, not, not by one single uh, country. But of course, I mean, we're concerned about um, the situation as far as the rule of law goes in, in Hungary, and that is reflected in, in the, the found funds that have been, that have been uh, uh, I mean, fr frozen, uh, you could say, in December at the eve of the, of the European Council meeting, two pieces of legislation were put into effect in Hungary that additionally weakened, uh, I mean, we made the situation worse. Uh, but we know, of course, that things can go in 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 another direction. Also, uh, I'm really happy to see to see the work being done in in Poland at present. Uh, it, it's difficult to rebuild structures uh, that have been, to some extent, been been dismantled. But we have been happy to see the progress made, and Poland has been um, presenting the progress uh, in a few General Affairs Council meetings already. Uh, but I think it's, uh, I mean, I think the lesson learned here is that whenever there is even small hints of the progress going in the wrong direction, it's important that Europe reacts, that EU reacts and, and takes note and, uh, and doesn't allow, allow for a slippery slope situation that, that we now at present are very much trying to, 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 to somehow uh, counteract and, and repair. Thank you. Yes. So we're hoping uh, things will improve. Uh, I have a question, Minister, from Tara Kuczek um, from the Institute. Ireland, along with Germany and Poland, is part of the extended Nordic Baltic Eight group. Uh, and it's an important partnership group for Ireland. How do you see that partnership evolving? What role can Ireland play in, in the Nordic Baltic Eight? And perhaps I could ally that with um, a question uh, with regard to uh, interest that has sh uh, recently shifted to the Arctic and the resources it possesses. What is the significance of the so-called Arctic resource race for Finland and other Nordic countries? Uh, well, I think the whole Arctic region 
will be a bigger focus on 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 of Europe. I mean, we hope Finland has long uh, uh, been a proponent 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 of uh, of the EU, really focusing more on that area. We know that uh, China is focusing. We know that Russia is focusing. We know the discussions. Uh, uh, that are a constant uh, as to who, I mean, where the borders are and who owns what areas. Uh, there are natural resources, uh, but there are also sustainability issues. Uh, I mean, the Arctic, Arctic region is, is, is very vulnerable. Uh, it's not possible to, to exploit it uh, in the way that it might have been possible to do in other areas. So there are uh, very big environmental concerns also and then of course we know that uh, climate change uh, is an issue uh, it of course you could say we will change the arctic but also because of that it is essential that we together stick to our goals and and, and do all, all we can to to keep it below 1.5 degrees in total so i think lots of things play into the play into the picture but in in general uh, I think the bigger coalition we can build around looking after these things, whether it's just the Baltic area or or, or, or the more Arctic region up, up north, uh, I mean the, the happier the happier we are, of course, because it should really be viewed as a as a common interest. Yes, and um, a, a positive grouping is the Nordic Baltic Eight, I think, and. Hopefully that could be a significant block mm -hmm. within the EU as we go forward mm -hmm. into the next parlamentary yes. term uh, and in the EU EU Council. Uh, it's it's a significant number of Northern European and if yeah. you put in Ireland, a Western European state yeah. has a long yeah. track record of, yeah. of um, uh, liberal democratic values, I think. So uh, yes. yeah, think, and as you said before, I mean we are very much aligned in, in on many issues. Yes. Um I have questions uh, concerning the um uh European parliamentary election uh coming again from Francis Jacobs. And his Francis says that in 2019 in the European parliamentary elections, climate change and the green transition were among the key issues and helped to mobilize younger voters in particular and to raise the turnout. Yeah. And this year, he says, there seems to be much less emphasis on these issues and indeed backtracking among many of the political families, including the larger group, the EPP. He asks, how can younger voters be mobilized in these circumstances? And how can the minister's emphasis on the green transition again be kick-started when there seems to be greater opposition? Yeah, I think this is a really really good con really good question and and uh, concern of mine also i mean i mean one concern of course is that that uh, uh, is there a risk that that the coming commission upcoming commission will not be as uh, uh, as progressive or say ambitious in in this regard and then of course also uh, the risk that we as politicians are, are not able to, to talk about the issues that, that really concern younger voters. Uh, I mean, global issues, whether it's uh, the threat to democracy, climate change, I mean, the, the fate of liberal democracies altogether, uh, how, how Europe can act as a counterweight to authoritarian countries uh, and so on. I think those all interest younger voters. And I think it's important that we also also are able to discuss discuss them. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, it, it's probable that the situation after the election will be such that those groups that traditionally have been talking a lot, a lot about climate change and the need for climate action, they might lose seats compared to groups that maybe do not see that as, as too big a goal. As, as a big big goal and and, and that uh, I think that that might lead need, need to a, to a shift and then I think it's also important in this uh, whole discussion to 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 also realize I mean when you think about the discussion during the elections that that uh, there will be probably hybrid actions toward uh, toward Europe I mean there will be efforts by for example Russia to sow so discussions around these topics 
uh, to sow so, uh, climate skepticism, uh, to try to weaken the front against Ukraine, uh, to, to, to maybe sow a discussion around uh, immigration that will be very polarizing within the EU. So I think it's also always worthwhile trying to, 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 to realize and, 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 uh, and, and identify these these issues. Uh, but in general, I mean, Ursula von der Leyen, she's been a, a big proponent of the green transition and she has had really an ambitious stance here. And, and of course, I, I, I really hope that, that in the case that she continues, uh, that she will set the bar high and keep it at, at a high position. And, and, uh, I, and I'm, I'm quite confident that she, she aims to do that. Thank you, Minister, for that. Um... The, uh, before we, we move on to maybe the industrial strategy and strategic uh, autonomy, I do have uh, from Brigadier General Ahern, uh, retired, uh, a question about um, uh, undersea cables on the maritime uh, mm -hmm. um, and the uh, situation uh, with regard to defending uh, the territorial waters. And the Brigadier General asks, is says, the EU's connectivity within and outside its member states uh, via undersea cable is critical to its ongoing economic well-being. And to date, the EU has never mounted a maritime unifor operation to include uh, the territorial waters of member states do you believe that this would ever be a possibility or should member states' territorial waters remain solely a national responsibility or a pooled one? It's rather a, uh, quite a technical defense question, but yeah. uh, obviously for well, Ireland... Well, I can't really say that I have... Yeah, yeah so for I Ireland... I can't really say that I have given that, that, that too much thought on, on that level, but I think it's, it's uh, clear that... Uh, I mean, the, there is a strategic interest in these cables, whether they are data cables or gas cables ga gas pipes or, or or whatever and 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 in this uh, in this world i mean we need connectivity we need data transfer and 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 uh, our systems of course are reliant upon those connections functioning uh, we know that there has been uh, i mean uh, an interest in our cables uh, from of course other other powers too so so I think it's not uh, the concern is not totally unfounded, and uh, and I think uh, I mean I think it's good good that there is a discussion on 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 whether we are paying enough attention uh, on them. Of course, we had an issue here. We had issues in 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 the Baltic Sea also about cables for one reason or another being being damaged. So. Yes, it's a it's a valid concern. I can say that much. Yes, and um, not it's a security, but also as you mentioned, an economic uh, concern. Yes. Uh, that that we're particularly conscious of here, um, Minister. The uh, uh, um, market based solutions you mentioned, rather than national subsidies, uh, to encourage mm. productivity in the EU. Uh, is there not a case for a coordinated EU offensive trade tools as well as defensive tools to protect not just the single market but also the EU interests in the world? Is one of the questions I have. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about strategic autonomy, and I think that is a valid concern. And we need we need to be aware of our dependencies. Uh, I mean, the EU has to. It is a trade union. We trade with the world. Uh, we mustn't turn inwards and and uh, and and be protectionist. Uh, we have to do trade deals with. Uh, I mean, we have to get the Mercosur through at some point and and, and so on. So so we are a trading a, a union that trades with the rest of the world. But of course, uh, harmful dependencies are harmful. And uh, if we as a union are too dependent on one provider. Or, or one nation as a provider, then we are by def definition sustaining vulnerabil vulnerabilities. So of course we should be uh, concerned about this and we should identify, identify them. Uh, in Finland, there's lot, I mean, we have lots of industries uh, that are growing rapidly. For example, the battery industry, where a lot of technology is, is in, in Chinese hands. A lot of the min minerals at present 
are in China's hands. I mean, that should uh, raise some concern. Finland, coincidentally, is the only country in Europe where we have all those minerals uh, within our borders. So, so that's why we are trying to develop also a, a, a battery industry, uh, also to, to secure the strategic uh, autonomy. Um, then, of course, if, if the question was relating to the subsidies, I mean, how, how do we react to, to the challenges uh, that, for, for example, the Inflation Reduction Act offers? I think that's a valid concern, um, but I think it's also worth noting that, that uh, of course, the IRA, uh, the size of it is, is difficult to, to define at present. Uh, there is not really a, uh, an upper limit um, but we have, of course, also had our, had our RRF uh, to the amount of almost a billion euros. Uh, we'd had lots of state subsidies during, during COVID times uh, and, and, and during the war. Uh, so, so the EU Europe has also used public funds uh, to some extent for the same means. Uh, but I think it's, uh, I think it would be, we would be wiser to try to, analyze how we create um, competitiveness in general. And I mentioned the Finnish example, uh, the market-based actors have uh, really transformed our energy sector. So Finland is now essentially, I mean, to a large extent, fossil free as far as, far as electric, electricity production goes. And by being fossil free, we also have the, 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 the second cheapest electric, electricity in Europe. So without state, state subsidies, uh, with just having regulation that allows for the companies to invest, we have created uh, a situation where we have the second cheapest uh, electricity in Europe. And that in itself creates a foundation for, for example, the battery industry, for data centers and, uh, and whatnot. So if we somehow have if we strengthen the single market, fix the problems that we have, because we have problems, create a neutral, um, a neutral playing ground for our actors, uh, get the uh, uh, get the capitalist market union um, to completion, uh, invest in research and development and and some infrastructure. Uh, I think then we will not have to talk about national subsidies for these investments because the foundation will be there and in the longer run it's a much more sustainable way of going going forward because uh, if we go for example the path down the path that i mean some projects have have been now showcasing uh, recently for example northwald in germany where we let in fact i mean the americans decide the level of our subsidies uh, by using this matching principle for the first time I think then we are on a slippery slope that will be especially challenging for for the smaller member countries. Yes, thank you. Just a side question, Minister uh, of Interest: What proportion of Finnish energy comes from nuclear? Um, uh, okay, I, I should have the number in my head, but it's something around uh, between roughly. thirty and 30, 40 percent. Yeah, a, a third, roughly. And yes. we, uh, I mean, last th this year, last year, uh, all kilowatt of three uh, went into production. It was a very long project that had uh, quite a few challenges, but that was 1,600 megawatts. But the year before, 2,400 megawatts of new wind power was introduced into the grid. So, I mean, the, uh, the amount of wind power built during one year was 50% uh, bigger than, than the whole capacity of this new nuclear plant. So I think we are building on, on, on many levels and, and a lot of wind is also, also being built. Uh, in that case, I, we in Finland, we have the, uh, a, a certain challenge that might not be um, so much of an issue for, for you in Ireland, but, but we can only, at present, we can only build wind power on our Western border because on our Eastern border, we need to have radar surveillance for obvious reasons. <laughs> so, so, so there's a small technical challenge that means that wind power is, is, is mainly focused on our, on our Western shore. But Finland is a very good country for wind power. And the fact that we have a really, really good grid allows for us to have uh, uh, parks in most areas of the country. I mean, wind power parks in most areas of the country. Yeah, that's certainly very impressive. Just a last point on China. I mean, I think there was a very, as far as European 
the EU is concerned, a very disappointing visit by Xi Jinping to Europe, uh, where he visited uh, France, uh, Serbia and Hungary. Um, I have a last question here. Are you, is, are you uh, satisfied that uh, Finland's plan to pivot to alternative sources of import from China um, is on track? And will that carry a financial cost? I think you've covered a lot of that, but um, is there some some way still to go? I'm not clear. I'm not sure if I heard your your answer correctly. I mean, our our plan to try to try to get rid of dependencies on China, from, specifically on China. Uh, yes, I don't think it's that much of a national plan. I think it's more and more a general European issue. And 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 of course, we. Uh, I was mentioning the battery industry that we are trying to grow here. Uh, that's just a, a fact that we realize that we have these minerals uh, and we need to be build build the value chains around them so that we through that can strengthen European uh, strategic autonomy and of course also also competitiveness. But Finland in general, I mean we are trading as before. I mean we are not of course restricting trade, uh, but the general as a general concern, of course, uh, we think that it's important that we uh, as Europeans, as, as, as a union uh, are not naive, but aware of uh, possible dependencies and, and, and constantly evaluate the, the, the possible risks involved. Yes, keep a watchful eye. Uh, Minister, to turn to the uh, an issue that all of the European member states are grappling with, and I know there have been specific issues in Finland, the issue of immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's obviously high on the agenda and uh, a particular issue now that the European parliamentary elections are uh, are coming down, um, coming closer. Uh, you have had specific issues in Finland where there have been um, uh, uh, immigration has been forced immigration in a sense over the border mm. from Russia. But yes. in general, how is Finland coping with uh, with immig the immigration? Uh, yeah. Situation. Yes, uh, in general, I mean, immigration to Finland is, is uh, I mean, the numbers are not very high. You could say that they should be higher. We have demographic challenges. We have, uh, we, we need a bigger workforce, for example. Now, I mean, during the last two years, the net immigration has, has been higher. Uh, I think it was 55,000 last year. So, so 1% of the population, which is pretty much where we think that it should be. Uh, and that's, I mean, the net situation, I mean, uh, uh, immigration minus emigration. But then, of course, we have the specific issue of, of, uh, of instrumentalized, uh, I mean, hybrid actions along our border. Uh, that has been uh, an ongoing discussion for, for quite some time. At present, the border against Russia is, is closed, which, of course, uh, is not a good thing in the long run. I mean, we have people here that have relatives in Russia and, and, and there is a need for, for some traffic, even though, I mean, the need for trade has pretty much uh, been diminished as a result of the war, but there is still a need for, for humans, for people to, to, to cross the border. <coughs> but, uh, but we are trying to deal with the instrumentalization issue and we are uh, now preparing legislation that could, um, give us some of the tools needed but in general i mean we think that this is uh, this is a european matter i think uh, on a european level uh, we should have a common idea of of uh, what instrumentalized migration is i mean the fact that russia for example uses uh, innocent people as as tools in order to 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 uh, uh, to pressure another country and of course ideally we would have a, a common approach a common set of, of, of tools and rules to tackle that uh, situation but now at present we are going forward with some some national measures that that will soon be discussed in in, in Finland's parliament and uh, while we are I mean waiting for that at present also the border is uh, closed at this has been now since uh, yeah since late last last autumn. Yes, as you say, um, a challenge, but Finland is supportive of the EU um, uh, immigration policy that has recently yes, been passed. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yeah. 
just we're we're closing, uh, coming to um, closing to uh, cl almost closing time. Um, you had a particular view, Finland and Ireland indeed uh, would be partners in this on African development. Uh, mm -hmm. I think do you, I think you view that as important uh, in mm -hmm. the sense of uh, EU partnership with Africa. Yes. Uh, in spite of all that's happening, that this should really uh, go forward and uh, be promoted. Yes, and I think uh, I think it's worthwhile for us uh, understanding or noting that uh, if if the EU isn't in Africa, then China and Russia will be. Uh, so, the, so there is not a void that will not be taken by anybody, but but Russia will be there and China will be there. And uh, and I think uh, either alternative is not uh, good for for the EU, nor nor do I believe it's good for for Africa. Uh, so of course, I mean, we really need to develop trade and uh, and have a, a, I mean, fair trade principles in order for for Africa also to being able to to to, to increase increase their their trade with Europe and and, and through that create uh, sustainable. Um, well-being and 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 prosperity uh, but i think uh, when i was in i was in dubai uh, at the climate meeting uh, a few months ago i mean last autumn and and discussed trade issues with uh, with uh, a few african countries and and for example our carbon border mechanism um, it has created some concern and and, and uh, of course issues like that should be um, marketed and explained correctly so so that it uh, it doesn't become come like a a trade war issue but it becomes a climate issue where we as long as we both adopt the same principles and standards we'll be able to trade more freely uh, and so on so there are lots of, of things that easily can be misunderstood and, and and that has raised some concern in in africa that we of course need to be aware of uh, but all in all yes uh, we can't afford not to have a focus on, on, on Africa because okay. other players are focusing on it. Yes, and quite a, a very last question, Minister. Um, you, you have put forward, Finland has put forward an initiative for an EU-wide preparedness strategy. Mm -hmm. And obviously um, the leaders have instructed the uh, Commission to prepare uh, that for the EU Belgian presidency uh, is drawing one up. Could you just briefly explain to us what that means? Yes, um, of course. I mean, Finland, we have a, we have a concept that's called. Uh, if I try to translate it freely, uh, it's uh, uh, the, the the concept of of like total security in a way. I mean, uh, it's a, it's a big security concept where we where we see that all actors in society have uh, have their role i mentioned our conscription based, based military service before but but it's not only about military issues it's, it's about uh, us of course having shelters in most uh, in most buildings we have uh, uh, we are prepared for crisis we have stockpiles of many things uh, we have I mean, ammunition in the case of a crisis, we have food, we have energy. Uh, the preparedness mindset is, is visible in, in, in the whole of our society. And it has uh, it served us well during COVID. Um, it will serve us well in the case, in the, in the case of, a, of, of a crisis in the future. But I think uh, it's, it's this concept and this uh, mindset that we, of course, think that the whole of Europe should have. Uh, I think we have now been painfully aware of, be forced to be painfully aware of, of uh, how our, I mean, our, our our bad preparedness as far as military production, for example, has has been to the benefit of Russia actually, and we have not been able to help Ukraine uh, significantly enough. But it's not only a military thing; it's 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 um, an approach to the whole society where everybody needs to be aware of their role and every, every everybody has uh, has a role to play in 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 both peace and and peacetimes and and in the case of a conflict 
Thank you very much. That's a very clear outline. And uh, I think that that strategy, when it's prepared, will be of help to us here in Ireland. Minister, thank you very much for your time this morning. Uh, we really appreciated it. I think we have learned a lot of the Finnish view and uh, the way you see the EU and its policies going forward. And um, we, um, we, Ireland and Finland have been good good friends, good allies, and I hope we will continue to be so. But thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. And goodbye. Yeah, thank, me, thank you for, for having me. I really enjoyed our, our conversation. And thank you all for the good, good questions. Uh, I look forward to, to a continued good cooperation. There's lots of things that unite Ireland and Finland. Indeed. And I hope we'll see you in person in Ireland sometime soon.